with pen in hand as they write this down. <laughs> I say this, you know, I say this and they go, you go, and then afterwards they go, now, what was the name of it? I don't know. I told it at the beginning. Um, morality versus godliness. <coughs> All right. Uh, last class we were in Hebrews 13, and we had uh, made the transition out of Philippians 4, 11. <coughs> and here in Hebrews 13, verse 5, let your manner of life be without covetousness and be content with what things as you have for he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so we see a, <clears throat> that God is tying together this thing of contentment being directly in relationship to our oneness with the Lord. Because in oneness, he, he can never leave you or forsake you. Do you understand that? I mean, it's, you know, can a man hate his own flesh? You know, that sort of thing um, that it talks about in Ephesians 5 because he's become one with us. Um, when you are, for example, I was put in an orphanage and whatever. So there is a thought that even though they love you, they can leave you and forsake you. You know, And they can visit you, you know, once every three months and say, I love you, and then forsake you. Is anybody at least following the mentality there? But in oneness, in oneness, you cannot leave or forsake. Because if you leave, you take me with you, Jesus. <laughs> you see that? If you forsake, guess what? I'm with you. You can't separate one. I know some of you math people are going, yeah, it's one half. <laughs> you can't separate one. One is one, all right? All right. Well, that's those people that find a loophole for fear. <laughs> In fact, it seems to be this little section right back here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sensing a black hole over here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, if you were a Bible school student that began and you listened to all these courses through all these years, there's, there's several things that are consistent. Not everything, but one thing is I'm in most of them. And Mike Wallace's laugh is in most of them. <laughs> All right, so we talked about this fact that his basis of contentment that he's telling you is for, I will never leave you or forsake you. So what, what our title of the last one was oneness or equality, where you're, you feel some sort of e being equal because of outward things, but oneness is not based on outward but inward things. All right, so let's transition over to... Um, Let's see, where, uh, second, no, first Timothy, first Timothy chapter six. <clears throat> first Timothy six, but uh, it's verse six also. First Timothy six, six, six. No, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. <clears throat> Just two sixes there. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, in the verse above it says, perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. So let me make a little noise on your things there and remove this just to write this down. And that is... Um, Gain, according to them, equals godliness. Okay. Gain equals godliness, meaning that the definition of godliness is gain. 
that gain in itself is godliness. So that the way that you understand godliness is gain. All right. Anybody ever heard that doctrine anywhere? Yes. Maybe so. Maybe, maybe so. All right. Okay, well, Paul is using the Bible, the word of God, to, to refute that by saying, but godliness with contentment is actually gain. All right, so it's reversed. Godliness, but not godliness in itself, but godliness plus contentment or contentment equals gain. All right? You see the difference? One says gain is the definition of godliness. Okay. Well, that's, can we say, can we agree, that's not right. <laughs> if for no other reason than the word of God says it's not. But then he gives his, de his definition he says, godliness in itself plus contentment is what gain is. That's the definition of gain. Okay. Well, that's what he's saying here. If, even if we don't understand it, now I'll try to explain it here, but that's what he's saying. Though that's the math, that's the equation. So-and-so plus so-and-so equals so-and-so. Um, if it was algebra, A plus B equals C. Okay? Good stuff. Thank you very much, Nicole. <coughs> um, that gain is not defined by amount of things. Therefore, covetousness has no place. Remember, that's what uh, that it, the scripture was talking about in Hebrews. Gain is not according to what their definition is. Gain in itself, the accumulation of things that you would covet after equals godliness. No. No that the true definition of gain is godliness and contentment. Okay? All right. That said, what I would like to do is if you'll turn to the first chapter of 1 Timothy. We're already in 1 Timothy, but if you'll go to the first chapter, and I'm going to show you real quickly for those who might be watching this on video. My Bible here has all these notes written in here. Do you see all that? That was written in here a long time ago. The Lord shared a bunch of stuff with me pertaining to our subject, which is, uh, I didn't write it on the board, morality versus godliness. Okay? And I wrote all that in there a long time ago, and I thought, why did, number one, write that, why did I write it in my Bible? And number two, when am I ever going to use this? <laughs> and I felt like the Lord told me this afternoon, I want you to get into this because this is teaching us this thing of oneness. This is teaching us this thing of the possibility of kenosis and still being stable. The possibility of self-emptying and still being stable. The possibility of emptying yourself of any requirement of God giving you equality in Christianity by proving through miracles or feelings or anything else that you are in, that that is not needed, that you can actually be emptied of those things and be content and um, and find the true basis of contentment 
in all circumstances. Okay, so I take that to this point of um, morality versus godliness. Now, the interesting thing about 1 Timothy, the book of 1 Timothy, it is a study, it is a study on godliness. It is a study on how godliness is actually the, the, the fulfillment of everything, if you will, and I'm going to explain that in a minute, the fulfillment of all these things, not in doctrines or in certain things like that, but in the true meaning of what godliness is. All right. When we talk of godliness, when we bring it up in our, just among ourselves or whatever, <clears throat> most people have godliness and morality as used interchangeably. Do you understand at least that that's, that's very common? All right. All right. Since I wrote most of this down, I'm going to <clears throat> depend on this. But before I, well, maybe I should go through that. Maybe I should go through these notes and then take you through 1 Timothy and show you <clears throat> how Paul in this book is emphasizing godliness as the means of handling everything and bringing forth everything. Again, you'll have to forgive me, jet lag is knocking at the door. It, it's not my rear that's in trouble here. It's my, <laughs> that, that would help. Or take this and shh, you know. All right, so it might be better if I read instead of try to think straight. The key to the book of 1 Timothy is the word godliness or other forms of that word, which would be godly or ungodly. And these are words that are used constantly through here. Godliness is higher than morality. And I'm, I'm glad to hear some comments and some head shaking in the positive way because what an incredible leap from morality to godliness. What an incredible reality that moves you into God instead of just rules, all right? <clears throat> so, as I said, some think they're interchangeable, but one word refers to right living with no reference to its source. Talking about morality or godliness. One of those words refers to right living with no reference to its source. Which word am I talking about? Morality, absolutely. It is referring to right living, but within its core, it has no reference to source. Yes. If we're going to use this later, but Second uh, Timothy three four, holding to a form of godliness, but not denying the power therein. It's like morality is a form, it's a shell, it's a hollow remnant. It's like a cicada shell of godliness, you know what I mean? And, it's, and it looks like something. I don't think people in Holland or Ireland would know, but I know what you're saying. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it looks like something, but it's not something. It is the shell of something that was living. Very good, very, very good. And that's where I want to go with this. Um, so, but godliness means that which is after God or of God, okay? Meaning it includes God. Godliness includes God. Morality doesn't have to include God. You can be a Hindu and be a moral person. You can be a Mormon and be a moral person. You can be an atheist and be a moral person but you cannot be an atheist and be a godly person, nor would they ever want to be, <laughs> which seems strange, doesn't it? They would never want to be godly, but they might want to really stand up for morality. That, what does that tell you right there? That in itself ought to scream 
Oh, oh, by the way, the word morality is never used in the Bible. But godliness is used, I don't know how many times that and its derivatives over and over in just First Timothy here. All right, so um, godliness means that which is of God or after God or out from God. It does not just speak of action, but of kind. Godliness. be similar to shayiness, that which is sort of shady, yeah. <laughs> there you have it. Okay, so it's not really speaking first and foremost of action, but of kind, but, but it is speaking of kind bringing forth certain actions. Are you following me here? It, in other words, morality would be a list of actions. But godliness is derived from God and therefore has a source that would produce those actions. That's incredibly important. Um, you cannot be godly without God. Morality speaks of a higher code that all must bow to, but godliness speaks of a higher being that all must come into union with. And this is where I've spoken in the past about the difference between the Ten Commandments and God. God does not adhere to the Ten Commandments because if he did, they would be higher than him, and they would be God. Now, I say that over and over, but I just think it's incredibly important because I think there are people here and maybe listening or watching that still don't get what I'm saying, but how important is this to get this? It's incredibly important because look at the importance we put on the Ten Commandments instead of conforming to the image of Christ. You know? So... Um, I'll repeat that again. You, um, morality speaks of a higher code that all must bow to or adhere to. But godliness speaks of a higher being that all must come into union with. Because there's not going to be any godliness without God. But guess what? There ain't going to be any godliness out of you without it being God and of God and by God. I mean, by him is what I'm trying to say here. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so it's not just about right or wrong actions, but about his actions manifested in mortal flesh. Do you see the difference? Right or wrong actions. Um, your conscience can tell you you did something wrong when it could have been Christ, it could have been. Your conscience has to line up with the nature of God. Your conscience is not higher than the nature of God. Now that, that's something to ponder, but it's not, it's not. And in fact, and here's why I say that, okay? Get ready. The nature of God is God. Your conscience is you, something of you. Okay? I mean, there's sound thought going into this because your conscience will not be right on unless it's guided by God. Yes? I think Well, and that's, that's why I said what I said earlier because I use that example because I've experienced that also. Um, be, and here's why. 
because many of us, before we were even open to the revelation of Christ, were uh, trained in the teachings of, and I'm not going to say Mao or whatever. What was uh, Jason? What was the guy that you went to, the Bill, Bill Gothard? And 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 uh, no offense, and I think that's you know I think the law has its place, but all he's telling you to do is to have morality and to do things right. Okay. The only thing that will will break you with Bill Gothard is to really get into Bill Gothard and then see how much you fail, see how much you cannot live up to those standards, okay? Then you're open to something higher, get ready, than Bill Gothard, okay? <laughs> and that's Christ. So Bill Gothard's teaching, in a, you know, and I'm not... I, I, I'm not judging or anything else, but it may just be morality, okay? Now, what's the difference? Could it be possible to take the teachings that should come, that, that, that are actions that should come by God called godliness, actions that come by God that are defined as godliness, and write them down? and define them, and then take God out of it and ask people to do it. Or? That's, that's right, all moral code in the earth, you know? And, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, we want people to do good, so do the Buddhists. So do all these other religions. And there's a code. But folks... We are not a people of a code. And when I say we, I'm not talking about new creation. I'm talking about all of Christianity. The thing that is supposed to make the difference is Christ himself. Okay, now when we say that, though, here's what people say. Yes, we have the right God. They don't. You know, Krishna, strike one. You know, well, in Hinduism, it's strike. Yeah, no, no, it's. Three million, three strike three million, <clears throat> which which by the way you're out, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> yeah. several several million times. It's it, but it but it's not, folks. Israel had the right God. Are you following me here? But they were following the code the moral code, and not by life, or shall I say it, godliness, produced by God himself. Or what is the way we term it? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So man is not meant to be a moral being but a vessel of God. Could I get in trouble for that? Will I? Probably. Probably. But folks, the greatest glory of this thing is that, that we have been made a vessel of the living God. Whether you call that an earthen vessel or you call that a branch or you call that a member of the body or you call it whatever you want to call it, all of those are avenues through which he expresses himself. He divinely comes into and fills up. All of the example, the temple of God, all of it is where he lives in whatever name you want to put on the vessel. Okay. And none of those examples is he expecting them to be moral. He's expecting them to be a vehicle of his life and nature and attitudes and character. It's just a fact. Okay. So these kind of teachings cause trouble because we, the Pharisees, want to be in control. We want to be right. We want some thing to be able to say we did it. But those who are not Pharisees, those who are the outcast, those who are the 
tax collectors, those who are the, you know, they don't have any hope except Christ, you see. And so that's where you get this. All right, so um, morality presents a standard of righteousness without giving the means to accomplish it. It just says do it. What's that Nike phrase? Just do it. Well, if that's true, Nike should have been God with Moses. You know, just do it, Moses. You know? The truth of the gospel says you can't do it. <laughs> An amazing reality. You can't do it, but I give you the means to do it, my beloved son. I am part the divine nature by which you are able to escape the corruption of this world, he says in, in Peter when he describes that. He doesn't just say you are partakers of the divine nature. He adds by which you are able to escape the corruptions of this world through lust and all of the desires and stuff that we're caught up in. What is our hope? being partakers of the divine nature. <clears throat> so, um, man by himself can never be godly. I mean, by, him, by himself. He can't. He, but can he be moral? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, absolutely he can be moral. I mean, a whole lot of the characters in the Bible that resist the truly godly people are not rank sinners. They're, they're moral people. They're the people who are the good off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? They're the good. So I said, man by himself can never be godly. We have not been introduced to a standard, but we have been introduced to a person, the vine. The vine. Jesus said, I'm the true vine. He didn't say, I, and he said, I'm the truth. He didn't say, I came to give you the truth. He said, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. I am your peace. I am your hope. Not I'm the hope giver. Christ in you is your hope. Colossians 1.27. Boy, this jet lag's fun. <laughs> Those who stand before God are of one kind or another. They're either sheep or goats. Right? What does that mean? They're judged for their works of what sort they are. Interesting, because everybody says you're judged by your works, but it says they are judged by their works of what sort they are, or whether goat or sheep. The, the thing that makes a difference is the kind. You look jet laggish also, young lady. Um, this is not a reference as to if they uh, reach a certain moral standard, but of what source they are of what kind they are. <clears throat> he said, of what, the scripture says of what sort they are, or what kind, what source they are. Um, morality does not lead to God getting the glory, but to man who submitted to God's standard. Right? In morality, there's a certain amount of glory that goes to you. But consider this. If it really is Christ in you, if, really, if Christ really produces that, boasting is eliminated. That's what it says in Romans. Where is boasting? There. Uh, and what does he say? Boasting is excluded. <laughs> Excellent, isn't it? It's just so well written, so clear. 
You cannot bring forth godly seed unless the seed of God is in you. <laughs> and I've got a bunch of scriptures here like being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth. And the other one was in Malachi 2.15 where it says that we may bring forth godly seed. In Genesis 1.26 we hear the first sentence of God in relationship to man. Let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Let him make him after our kind. Let him be of the same source as it were. Now, the moralists would say, God would say, let us make man in our own image, moral and godly. Or moral and, see, I, I, I blew it right there because that's moral and correct in their actions. You see what I'm saying? He didn't say that. If he makes us, truly if he makes us, if we conform to his image, if we are changed into that same image from glory to glory, then he will produce what he always produced before we ever came along. The same, the one, the one that we say is the same yesterday, today, and forever is also the same in eternity past as he is in us right now, as he will be forever and ever. Because he is he that was and is and is to come. Because not only is boasting excluded, but in godliness, we are excluded. And that's what takes care of boasting. Because we, you know, and this is what I was sharing in, I don't remember where, I was in several countries and I can't remember where I was sharing it, but we were talking about um, uh, in uh, Galatians 6 where it says, Paul says, God forbid, in, in Holland, God forbid that I glory, but in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then he defines that because we would automatically say, yeah, where he died for our sins, and he, he just flat out says it. By whom the world, the world is crucified, unto me, and I am crucified to it. Okay? But you just, let, instead of Xing it out, let's erase the world now, and let's erase me, and all you got left is Jesus. That's what it said, and that's what Paul said. I am crucified to the world, and the world crucified to me. Well, we, we still, somehow we still see us in that equation, you know, the world minus me equals Jesus. You know, I am crucified to the world. I'm gone then. The world is crucified to me. Gone. What's left? Christ. Where does he dwell? In you. Where do you dwell? In him. How does this work? By him. Who's the one? He's the one. What am I? The vehicle of expression. Expression of what? His nature. His person. His being. Then, then do I ask you to hand me the moral code that I can study all the precepts? Or do I ask you to hand me the Bible and the Holy Spirit that he may reveal his son in me that godliness may truly come to pass? That's, that's the real issue, and that's the real question. Is the Bible God's book of, you know, somebody says, well, you know, uh, the Bible is God's uh, uh, handbook on how to do it right. Instruction manual. It's his instruction manual. Well, you, well, partially true. It is instructing you in Christ, that your life is Christ that you are dead, that he is your life. 
These factors will never go away, folks. I mean, they are continually brought up in the Word of God and all over the place. I was reading, I think it was in 2 Timothy, close to where you were quoting that, that scripture, and there it just plainly says, well, you're dead, and uh, uh, the issue is, is over with. Let's see if I can even find it here. I probably won't because my eyes are fuzzy right now. Um, I did find it, 2 Timothy 2 and 11. If it is a faithful saying. Would anybody like to hear a faithful saying? I mean, a faithful saying. Would you like to hear a faithful saying? Here it is. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. What is that saying? That's saying God's being pretty faithful to tell you the truth. And the truth is, if you die with him, then you'll live with him. But more importantly, the truth is, as you, as you take in the full scope of the scriptures, you'll live by him. Because I am crucified with Christ, Christ lives. All right, let's go back now to, to uh, 1 Timothy, because I need to go, I need to finish these notes, and then I need to just take you as quickly as I can through the book of 1 Timothy so that we can swallow the whole pill that it's about godliness and how he's proving this point. And remember this, godliness requires the reality, if you will, the doctrine, if you will, the revelation of it is absolutely imperative to have the understanding that godliness requires Christ in you. There's no getting around it. He's God. Okay? So, the term godliness is not some sort of holiness term. The term godliness is not some sort of doctrinal term used outside of those who preach the revelation of Christ. The term godliness is the fulfillment of Christ in you and the, and the result of, if you will, not necessarily the fulfillment. It is the manifestation of the fulfillment of that, Christ being revealed in you. <clears throat> Let me finish reading here. I think that might have been it. Yeah, it was. Okay. So let's let's go through here now. Yes, come in. Yeah. Silly now, but I don't know, just for those listening, just take out the L I in the word. You know what I mean? Godness. You know what I mean? Very good. It like makes it a little more direct to current vernacular. Amen. I mean if you took if you took God out of godly, you just got Lee. You know, I mean, that's not enough to live on, all right? <clears throat> well, if you took the D out, it, you'd have goalie, so. <laughs> or golly. <laughs> or, yeah, golly. I can't do it, golly. <laughs> and, and I apologize to all the people in other lands that listen or watch this for our people here. <laughs> but it is the cross that God gave me to bear. <clears throat> and they, as they say under their breath, and you are the cross God gave us to bear. I, I heard you. <clears throat> All right, let's see if we can, uh, how much time we got left back there? All right, it's 22, but the truth is our clock is counting down on how long this class should go. So I will do this as quickly as we can. Uh, uh, chapter one, First Timothy, chapter one, verse four. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do godly edifying, which is built. The word edifying means to build up, which can only be done by God. But when it says godly, it is God working in you. Okay. Verse nine. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly. The law is made for the ungodly. If you have God, you don't need the law. Can I get another amen? That's just ridiculous, isn't it? God doesn't need the law. All right. Let's continue because it stays good. <laughs> uh, chapter 2 and verse 2. 
um, for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Okay. Well, you can't live in honesty unless you live godly. Not really. Okay. But it is that the life that we are supposed to live, okay, we are, okay. Let's go back to verse 1 of this chapter. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving and thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So here's how we read that. I'm going to pray for President Obama so that I can live a quiet, peaceable life on this earth. And we won't have wars or even rumors. Okay. Nice, sweet, total contradiction of what Jesus said, that things will grow worse and worse, you know. <laughs> okay, I mean, it is. Except he's not saying that, and it's not contradicting that. It's saying, be in prayer for this because we want to live a godly life. We want to live by God. And if you do, you pray for others. All right, let's keep moving here. Verse 10, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Okay, so it's saying you don't wear this and you don't wear that. And you don't. Well, no, it's not saying that. It's saying that it's not found in those things. It is found in being a woman professing God's at work in her. How many of you ladies would like to be a godly woman? I would hope you already are. What did I mean by that? That you're moral and that your standards are high and that you would never wear anything that would shock anybody or that you wouldn't. You know, folks, if you let Christ live in you, he'll take care of whatever. Do you believe that? Do you believe he, that he's sufficient enough to figure this thing out? And that your first goal is to allow Christ to live in you, all right? Let's continue. Verse, uh, chapter 3 now, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Okay, what are you saying here, buddy? This is getting doctrinal now. This is, you know, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. All right, I, how many will join with me when I say, I want to know this mystery of godliness. Anybody? Here in the Bible is telling us there is a mystery of godliness. God, open our eyes to see the mystery of godliness. Well, it's not really too deep because it says it in the next phrase, God was manifest in the flesh. There's godliness. Get it? It's an incredible mystery. If you, <laughs> it's so deep, it's hard to find. Godliness is God in the flesh, in you. <laughs> but the mystery of it all was that the Jews didn't get it. They thought godliness was following his teachings, not God being manifest in the flesh. You get it? It's not really deep. It's just, it's just simply has to be God. You can't, again, you can't have godliness without God. Or you just have leanness, leanness of soul. All right. Um, chapter 4, verse 7. But refuse profane and old wives' fables. And exercise thyself rather unto godliness. All right. So verse 7 is stating that, look, let's not get into fables and things that people say and old wives' tales and this and that. Let's just live by Christ. You got it? We go, oh, yes, you know, let's not do that. And we get in, and we never see Jesus in any of this, but wait. That's what he says in that verse, but he wants to change subjects and show that Christ in you is the answer for all of these little things. So he says, for bodily exercise profiteth 
and, and in, if you'll check your margin there, those who have it, a little. Bodily exercise profiteth a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is, because it's the only promise you're going to get, the only hope that you have of glory, and of that which is to come. So here he says, okay, now refuse getting into all these wives' tales. And if you'll follow really the whole book up to this point, he is saying, don't get into disputations, don't get into doctrinal arguments, don't get into this and that. He says, but follow after godliness. Just live Christ. You got nothing to prove by wrangling over doctrines. Just go after Jesus. Learn Christ and let him be formed in you. And then he says, okay, but let's talk about another subject. You flabby people. <laughs> he says, I want to talk to you a little bit. Stop eating so much. No, he doesn't say that. He says, okay, you're right, you people that are all into exercise and stuff and that, that are, you know, run marathons and everything, uh, physical exercise profiteth a little. But if you really want to know what will profit, let Jesus live in you, godliness. Are you following this? Are you seeing how this is... He's literally answering all these different separate things that they're going, well, there's this issue and there's that issue. There's the physical issue. Then there's the, the doctrinal issue. Then there's this and that. And he's just shooting it down one after another. Let it be godliness. Let it be God at work in you. Forget all the, the law of the thing and get the life of the thing and the life of Christ will produce what the Father wants. Does anybody say, amen, glory to Glory to God, because through godliness, the glory will only go to God. All right? Let's, we're getting close here. Chapter 6 and verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Well, I guess we probably need to... Well, the basic gist of what he's trying to say is still in this verse, and that is um, there are things that people are teaching that you should do or not do. Are you with me on this? There are things that people are teaching. This You have to do this. Well, if you're a Christian, you do this. Well, you do this and you do that. Oh, no, you don't do that and you don't do that. That's that's the line that he's been going on for a while. And then he says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words. All right. <clears throat> Let's stop right there. Wholesome words. Those are words that have a lot of wheat germ in them. No. They are words that are uh, well said. They are words that are um, uh, that perfectly line up with correct teaching. Okay, perfectly line up with correct morals. No, no. Are, are they always gentle or sweet or kind or whatever? No. Um, where am I even at? If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even, and do you know what the word even there when it's used, it means this is what I'm talking about. Okay, when it says even, it's a da 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 da, even or this is the identification of it, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, well, you better believe that I'm a Christian and I'm going to go by the words of Jesus Christ. Well, you can say it like that, and you know what you're going to end up doing? You're going to end up making the law out of Jesus' own words. So let's continue the sentence. Let's finish the sentence. Is that good? Can we do that? Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and according to the doctrine, okay, it's got to be according to the doctrine. It's got to be 
you've got to be according to the right doctrine. No, he didn't say according to the right doctrine. He said according to the doctrine of godliness. Or, the, or can we say it another way? According to the doctrine of Christ in you producing what comes out of you. That, that's exactly what he said. There's no way of getting around it. This letter is based on this whole concept of godliness being Christ in you. Wait, we're not finished. We still got several verses that talk about godliness yet. Verse 5. Perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that, oh, here was where we started, isn't it? Supposing that gain is godliness from which such withdraw thyself. All right, let's go back to our board. Gain equals godliness. Gain in the mind of many modern day Christians is God prospering you. Now, now I'm going to ask you a question. Is God, it is the definition of God prospering you, is, is, is that Christ in you or is that you getting stuff? Is that you not even having to live by Christ in you, just being a Christian that gets stuff from God through miracles and blessings? He says they suppose gain is Christ in you or they don't even acknowledge godliness as being Christ in you. They say gain is morality or gain is God <coughs> with you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Clearly he shows that in the very next day. But godliness with contentment is great gain now we've come full circle because what we were talking about in the last class was oneness or equality. And you do not find contentment if, you're, if your goal is equality or being equal, especially with other believers. You're going to want your share of the inheritance. And you're going to want it to prove in, in order to prove to everyone else that you are of God. <clears throat> and you will need it. Not in God's timing. You will need it when you feel like, I need proof now to show people I'm of God. <clears throat> right. This is, what a deception, because this leads you to a place where when you should, you know, where God will lead you into the dark valley, where he will lead you into the prison cell, where he will lead you to the cross, and he expects you to manifest his life there. We're not manifesting his life there. We are, um, we are tempting God at that point. What is tempting God? Give me a sign that I'm as equal as everybody else. Give me a sign of equality. Give me a sign, or give them a sign, really. <clears throat> um, I wrote a sentence down here somewhere. Let's see if I can find it. Okay, I made this statement. They knew who they were and how God viewed them, regardless of their circumstances. They did not tempt the Lord or put him in a position to have to prove these realities by means of outward Signs. Has anybody ever wondered what does it mean to tempt God, to test God? Because it's a it's a it's a woeful thing in Hebrews when it talks about they tempted God in the wilderness. Okay, it's very simple. They got to a position where they didn't think they had any water. <clears throat> And they said, did you bring us out in the wilderness to kill us? What is this? Is this of God or not? Are you of God or not? Have God strike this rock or do something, you know, to bring forth proof that, you're, that we're of God and that this is all of God and everything. And 
through the whole thing. They provoked him. They provoked him because they didn't believe in oneness. They were separate and they acted separate and they said, God, you exist to make sure that I feel, you know, it's like this, make sure that I have reason to have faith in you. Can we have faith in God when he doesn't come through for us in the natural over, over things? Yeah. Can we love him when he doesn't do everything the way we want it? Can we, can we believe that we're still one with him even when everyone else says you couldn't possibly be, you're a bad person? And yet we still believe it with all of our heart. Can we stand in the face of major opposition and love God just like we always have? Can we do that? And not and not be ashamed. I mean, you know, I, I'm telling you that there are things in the natural that want to shame you. The question is, are you ashamed? You know, and, and he said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you. If you're ashamed of me before men, you know. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of godliness or saying it has to be Christ. I'm not ashamed of that. I am, I'm not ashamed that I am so weak that it must be Jesus. <laughs> but many people are. They want to be strong. And they want to look strong at all times. And they want to look good at all times. But if if it is Christ in you, then you and you are one with Him, then you look good to the Father. <laughs> you know, the Father would look at you and you say, "You're looking good. I see Jesus." <laughs> Amen. You know, we and when He says that at first, you know, "You're looking good." What do we do? Well, thank you. I, I feel good. Or do we go wait for him to finish? He goes, you're looking good. I see Jesus in you. And that's what I'm looking for. And it doesn't matter if the whole world is ranting and raving. That's what you're giving the Father with all your heart, soul, and strength. Can you do that? Then, then you will know something about Self-empty. Or, what's the word, the actual Greek word? Kenosis. Remember, we're actually learning practical stuff here, not theology. Got it? Father, we just ask you by your spirit to communicate life in these things. Lord, we are not trying to put down anything. We're trying to lift up Christ as everything and to trust him in all things and to believe that he can bring forth exactly what is well-pleasing and that you made us one with him and you put him in each and every believer to that end that it may be what he produces through us that glorifies you, that brings forth the fruit in our little branches. So we look to you, Lord, and we believe in you, and we find contentment in you and in this union, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name, amen. We're dismissed.